morning. Welcome to session one. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yes, welcome to session one. Uh, governing in the time of COVID and our climate emergency. Uh, it's a great delight to uh, be part of this panel and to be presenting in this innovative uh, invention of ASCs in this uh, time of Zoom overload. Um, the event we've uh, got planned for you this morning is built around the hidden power of systems thinking, governance in a climate emergency, a book recently published by myself and Ed Straw. The uh, panel we've put together have all got some connection with the book and uh, the book not only in terms of uh, uh, its uh, gestation, but its use uh, afterwards. So Huda Kayam will speak after I've finished speaking. Uh, Fred Steyer will speak next. My co-author Ed Straw will follow and I'll wrap up before we break out into chat rooms for 15 minutes and then a final 15 minute plenary where you'll have a chance to have your questions answered. So, um, governing in the time of COVID and our climate emergency, uh, well, these uh, three waves are essentially upon us. We may not be present uh, so much every day with climate change, but it is there and far more substantial than uh, the other two. What uh, links all of these uh, three, even though uh, it's a particular framing of mine and it may well be contested, is that these are all at base biological phenomena and are about human relationships with the biosphere and about our co-evolutionary future. I've seen a new press release today uh, saying that uh, there's more evidence that the virus was actually manufactured in Wuhan. So whether it's a human invented technology or a product of biological escape uh, is I guess going to be a debate we'll have over the next period of time. But the recession itself tends to be framed as an economic issue, whereas I would contend and the argument of our book is that economics is only one particular manifestation of how it is to be social. And we are essentially biologically social animals. So the thing that links all of these is to do with our co-evolutionary future uh, as a species. And of course, the last one, climate change, is one that's completely new to human history, whereas recessions and COVID or pandemics have been with us before. Uh, the book around which this uh, talk is organized is um, organized in a number of ways. Uh, our contention is that systems thinking in practice provides the means to understand and fundamentally alter the systems of governing uh, our lives and that this will rescue and protect the planet for us and for all natural life. Uh, in saying that, we understand systems thinking in practice as braiding lineages and understandings from systems theory, from uh, cybernetics and complexity theory. And now you may think this is a big claim, but we invite you to read the book and to uh, test the claim yourself after you've read it. Uh, of course, it's more than just governance uh, in relation to uh, climate. It's about uh, how we uh, address major imbalances in power, wealth, and well being in our societies as well. The book's divided into four parts. An introduction uh, provides an update of, the update of the human problematique uh, in the sense that Hassan Azbekian formulated the problematique when he wrote his work for the uh, Club of Rome that led to the Limits to Growth work. Many of the things that he spoke about then are with us today in much more exacerbated terms. Part one applies to systems thinking, to why governance and governments are failing. And of course, we understand governance in its cybernetic sense uh, related to the Greek kybernau, meaning to steer. And we offer other metaphors linking systems and cybernetics ideas for governance. Part two answers the question, what is systems thinking in practice? Part three contains our proposals for applying uh, STIP to governing. There are six chapters in uh, part three. So there are ideas about constitutions, about feedback, about praxis. And uh, it underpins a central argument that we need to do more than trying to make our current systems uh, effective, first order change, and that we advocate fundamental change or second order change. A heuristic that sits at the 
part of the book is uh, a simple way of understanding uh, governance or our current governance systems. This is the relationship between the state, judiciary and law, the private sector and civil society, and the media. This is a very uh, high level heuristic, which needs a lot of unpacking, but in our book, you'll see how this could be unpacked for any state in the world, whether it's the Chinese state or the American state or the Australian state, there are ways of unpacking that and seeing different elements uh, and systemic uh, relationships between these different elements. Now, we also argue that this particular model of, of governance, which uh, prevails, is fundamentally and irredeemably flawed. Well, the elements in the institutions and practices that put them into operation were developed before the rise of multinational companies, bigger than 70% of nation states, before the invention of technologies that enable global connectivity, 24-hour news cycle, awareness of the responsibility for the technosphere, and awareness acceptance that we humans have created the conditions of, uh, on Earth which change the whole Earth dynamics, which some call the Anthropocene. There are interrelationships between this, these elements which create emergent uh, properties which are exemplars of failure, and this is known in some circles as state capture, and particularly in South Africa with Jacob Zuma, uh, or preferential lobbying which prevails in just about every society. George Monbiot in The Guardian uh, yesterday wrote a very powerful argument about the extent of corruption in the British state, for example. We uh, contend in the book that we have to um, reinvent this uh, governance diamond by adding new elements to create new systemic relations. We need to inhabit those uh, elements with new practices and new institutions, where institutions comes from the institutional economic sense of rules or norms of the game that we humans invent. The new elements that we are proposing in the new governance system are the biosphere, which we see as absolutely central to our ongoing co-evolutionary future. And it breaks out of the trap of the old dualism of humans and the environment and the way in which economics treats the environment as an externality or something to be exploited. The technosphere is all those structures that we humans have constructed, all the stuff we've deposited on the face of the earth. In fact, at last counting, something like 30 trillion tonnes of stuff or 50 kilograms for every square metre of the surface of the earth. And the final point is the uh, social purpose. Our contention is that a central aspect of being human is to be purpose and to be, uh, uh, to live a life of well being driven by our sense of purpose. And that currently the state, as we've constituted it, is a very poor arbiter or designer or engager with citizens about the issue of purpose. And so we argue the case that to achieve social ends in deliberative forms of systemic inquiry and social learning, we need to invent new institutions of social purpose. Now, this requires, of course, some transformation and one has to have a theory of change. How is uh, this change going to come about? Um, well, we don't have a blueprint for change. But you need to be able to talk about governance in systemic terms. And these heuristics are designed to be able to have a conversation and to talk about how you may change governance as a system. Uh, we need to embrace uh, second order change, not first order change. And uh, we cannot inhabit the new systems without traditional ways of thinking and acting. Otherwise, we'll only uh, undermine any innovation we make. And our contention is that cybernetics and systems offer forms of praxis and ways of thinking to design uh, more uh, thrivable uh, futures. So design biosphere relations, anthropocene awareness, abandon laissez-faire technology development, it needs to be brought under human uh, deliberation and control invent new institutions to negotiate social purpose and inventing and enacting a new form of systemic governance, 
fit for our contemporary circumstances. And with that, I'm going to hand on to my colleague, Huda Kayam, uh, to take this uh, panel forward. Huda, over to you. Thank you, Ray. I would like to start with briefly situating my research. During uh, 22 years of practice in international development, I have experienced a limited effectiveness of technical, rational, vertical, short-term projects in addressing protracted, often very complex social issues. And I am surprised that systems uh, approaches are still marginal in the design of policy and intervention uh, to address wicked development situations, issues such as climate change and the COVID crisis. I found a deep resonance with, between the content of Eisen and Stroll 2020 and my situation of concern, that is current governance systems failing to mitigate the outcomes of the Anthropocene, such as global warming. So I engaged with the book as a set of inquiry pathways that feed into my PhD research about how to institutionalize systemic governance of the Anthropocene, or in other words, how to mainstream systems thinking in governing practice as a strategy to shift away from the Anthropocene trajectory in the current context of global warming and all other types of crisis that derive from the Anthropocene. So um, my research draws on the metaphor of governing as um, a trajectory correcting co-evolution with a focus on sustaining cyber systemic institutions. In this picture that you see here on this slide, you, you see that our feet mediate our connection with the biophysical system the co-evolution, the institution is there that we call the technosphere. And I was thinking perhaps taking off these shoes and experiencing a more direct, less technologically mediated connection with the biophysical system. Let's see what happens. Next slide. <clears throat> so one can find many strands of inquiry in the book. I saw, for example, each of the 26 principles for systemic governing as a potential PhD research in its own right. And I was particularly interested in the case here of compassionate communities. Um, and here again, I am intrigued that a successful model of systemic governance that contributed in a very tangible manner in improving the health of the population of Frome, while, and this is the beauty of it, reducing the cost of unplanned admission by over one million pound did not yet become at least considered as a national model of health governance, especially in the COVID health and economic crisis. So when I read the author's metaphor of the government as an organization disconnected from its environment that can hardly receive and respond to feedback, I saw it as a plausible explanation which triggered the question of how to enact a cyber systemic relationship between the states and innovative communities. Next. So here we have an alternative uh, with the story of the flood defenses. This is another example provided in the book uh, in Sheldon that showed that the states were actually to be more precise. And I think the nuance is important here. A part of the states, if we see the state as a system, the part of the state here being the environment agency, learning from an institutional failure in Tainmouth when they use this very vertical top-down decide, announce, defend, which I'm quite familiar with, to engage, deliberate, and decide, which is a more collaborative approach, and that was successful in Sheldon. So what we could see here is that there was an enactment of feedback, a learning that was applied and actually they came back to a timeout and it was also successful, but it takes a bit longer. So to me, this uh, experience resonated very much uh, as an application of Checkland soft systems methodology. And I found it also to be an interesting case to inquire using Donald Sean's framework in his classic Beyond the Stable State, such as government as a, so, as, um, a learning system the concept of public learning and the very interesting also concept of dynamic conservatism to explore the question of how to mainstream governing practice as a social learning system right 
So here you can see a rich picture that I adapted. It's an adaptation of a heuristic model in the book called uh, PSFM, where a practitioner, P, engages in a situation of concern, S, with a framework of concepts and ideas and a set of methods that constitute a methodology. Um, and here you see the blue arrows and the blue arrows illustrate the influence of this practitioner's traditions of understanding in the choices made about the frameworks and the methods. Um, you can also see that this is a second order cybernetic framework par excellence as here I am also the researcher seeing herself as a practitioner engaging in the research. So I am using this heuristic to design my systemic co-inquiry as a second order cyber systemic practice of research. And last but certainly not least, I see the book as a reflexive device that is fostering my own transformation from a very mainstream linear thinker, top-down um, manager, of uh, development projects to a second order cybernetics practitioner in the area of international development. Thank you. Thank you, Huda, very much. So I'll now hand over to Fred Steyer. Uh, thanks, Ray, and thanks, Huda, and it's uh, wonderful to be following you. So um, welcome, everyone. I'm coming to you from a uh, rather steamy Tampa, Florida, and I mentioned that um, because one of the things that the, uh, Ray and, and Ed's book really points out and Huda also alluded to is the importance of sense of place and recognizing particularly in our current circumstances of uh, the pandemic, how we may think about sense of place differently and where we are and where, you know, what our own boundaries are in terms of movement. Uh, so when I said I was stuck in Florida, I, we literally are stuck here right now, awaiting a storm by the way. But sense of place becomes an important issue because one of the things that stood out for me when I had the pleasure of reviewing the book before publication was the importance of framing uh, and how Bateson's initial ideas about framing uh, need to be both brought forth and rethought in the act of thinking about governance in the sense that Bateson's ideas from his initial work on the message, this is play, where you know, he noticed in primates in a zoo, wondering how it was that they developed these meta-communicative strategies that allowed them to recognize when they were playing, when they were fighting, and to almost think about the question of, are we playing or are we fighting? And how do we actually get into the same frame? And one of the challenges about governance, which um, Ray and Ed's book deals with very well, is recognizing that governance includes recognition or appreciation in Jeffrey Vickers' sense of the value judgments and of the reality judgments that, that involve holding on to the ambiguity of what frame we're actually in and not assuming even right now in this meeting that we're all in the same frame. So I might be wondering whether you're expecting me to be giving you a lecture or inviting you into a conversation about things that I'm really unsure about. My intent is the latter, but I have no way of legislating that that's the frame that you're in. Now, the way that I've actually used this book, even though it's new, in um, courses that I teach, uh, which are actually called knowledge areas at Fielding Graduate University, and have learned from students using the work uh, in terms of the meaning that the book is actually affording them. And the background, uh, one project that, um, you can see closely connected to it. It's actually not a project that's coming from students, but one that students are also making use of is one that's the overheating project, which is uh, led by uh, cultural and social anthropologist, Thomas Tillen Erickson in Oslo, Norway, but is actually global. And the idea behind this project is bringing Bateson's notions of framing and without realizing it, the governing ideas in the time of climate change that Ray and Ed bring forth, the idea of the, uh, the overheating project is how conversations around climate change and climate change denial, uh, conversations around national identity and immigration, and conversations around economics in the public domain take on the same form. They all um, wind up in these almost schismogenic conversations, I'd say a symmetric schismogenesis of which uh, frame is actually the one that should be the dominant frame. 
And one of the things that we're finding out, which Ray alluded to in the beginning, is how very often the economic, this is something that's happening right now with the pandemic. Is this a health crisis or an economic crisis? And uh, are people making decisions out of values that underlie the economics of the situation over the health, with, with its uh, rather tragic consequences in some places? And <clears throat> Another example of this is work that's being done by a student named Will Miner, and his name is actually appropriate, uh, in northern Minnesota, uh, where the tradition, the work tradition has been one of the mining, the iron ore mines. It's actually called the Iron Range for people who were local there. And how work has been, uh, jobs are smaller as the mines have more or less dried up. And uh, whether or not a mining company can come in and build new jobs at the expense of what's going on in the environment. So Will has been attending public meetings trying to understand using, and Huda, I'm glad you brought Don Schoen's work in, uh, Schoen's idea of frame dilemmas of, are the meetings in public spaces relying on the underlying frame being one of economics and jobs or one of the environment? Are our people being placed in these situations of do we, in making a choice about having jobs, are we destroying the very environment that is connected to our sense of place? And how is this actually playing out? And what is the role of governing in doing this? Um, I see that we also have Flavio Mesquita da Silva in the audience here, and maybe whichever group Flavio is in, Flavio can share some of his work that he was doing in Brazil, recognizing this question in bringing a project called Generations of Peace to the redesigning the school system and thinking of you know, our schools about uh, education in a sort of uh, lecturing sense or about developing relations of appreciating each other and how, uh, how do you redesign, how do you create a design process for rethinking, uh, reframing the, those very issues? Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll stop there because I want to make sure that I allow time for conversation. Okay, good. Thanks very much, Fred. Uh, Ed, it's over to you and I'll uh, give you the rest of the time until we go to the breakout room. Okay. So, it, is there a slide, Ray? Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, taking a, a different way through this uh, and, and just picking up two examples, these are not super uh, researched, um, interestingly, these points came out of conversations with uh, people. One was a hairdresser uh, and one was a friend. So Sweden, uh, there's no lockdown. There wasn't any lockdown. It turns out it's unconstitutional. Uh, freedom of movement uh, of people is guaranteed within Swedish society and you're not allowed to stop uh, children uh, moving around. But on top of that, they have this concept of, and my pronunciation is going to be awful, uh, which means self-responsibility and uh, deeply embedded independent agencies. So most of what people had to do in Sweden was decided by agencies that are, that are very well established and are independent of government and or politics. So you put that lot together and, and it produces the sort of outcomes that we've seen in Sweden. Um, New Zealand, uh, consensus of government, uh, they ab abolished first past the post, but a point was made to me very strongly and the Maori culture was not obliterated as it was in some other societies where indigenous cultures got blitzed. Uh, and that emphasizes very much land and individual rights and personal rights once more. So you see uh, two different combinations of culture and constitutions and the way in which they uh, deploy institutions producing in both cases different but quite good results in relation to COVID. Next slide please, Ray. Um, but no constitution is cybernetic. So you have these three branches, legislature, executive, judiciary, what's missing? Well, uh, on this call above all, feedback uh, and automatic course correction on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, the participants, the citizens, the citizens branch. 
Um, so um, we can see some big holes. Next slide, please, Ray. With those big holes, one of the crucial things that gets in the way of government and produces many of the adverse uh, uh, consequences that we see is this thing, preferential lobbying. So uh, a, a business typically, but it could be a major organization, it could be a, 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 an influential group, uh, wealthy people, uh, are able to get their uh, say too often in government and therefore preferential lobbying does these things, which is severely limited. Uh, responses to climate change uh, has, has uh, exacerbated uh, the uh, inequality in wealth, power and well-being. It very directly, and you can trace this through and look at the research on this, it takes money out of typically your and my pockets and the pockets of uh, uh, many other people, the masses in other words, and puts them into uh, the pockets of those uh, who are wealthy. And it's a crucial point here. It's never about wealth creation, preferential lobbying. It's also always about wealth appropriation. Um, and of course, then you, you, you get these preferential lobbying uh, lobbies going on, the classic one in the States, uh, with uh, the, the, the way in which taxes and the tax laws uh, are uh, developed and, and so on. And, and we end up with all sorts of wrong government decisions, policies, laws, regulations, programs, and projects. Now, let's have a look at preferential lobbying and say, why does it happen? And, and this is what we did as part of our research. These are the conditions that enable or indeed allow uh, preferential lobbying, fairly yes. obviously. Two minute warning, thank you. Okay. Um, well, if you read uh, through those, I mean, some of the gr most gross and obvious ones where you see, in essence, uh, senators and, and policies being bought by the rich in the states. And you can see that. Well, let's uh, go from those are the conditions that allow preferential lobbying through to how do we stop it. So next slide, please, Ray. and you turn it on its head. And those are the things that you need to put into a constitution to stop preferential lobbying. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll end at that point because unless those things happen, uh, then the sort of societies that we have at present, the, 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 the inadequate response to climate change, the inequality, the poor poor governance that goes on will continue. Um, so that, I guess, in brief, is why I regard constitutions as so important. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Ed. Um, uh, just brief you for the breakout into the chat rooms. I mean, you'll go to the chat rooms now, you'll be allocated automatically. I'd ask you to consider uh, your own experience of your own governance systems and draw uh, some insights into those governance systems using your understanding of uh, uh, cybernetics systems uh, and complexity theory and see uh, whether they resonate with the arguments we are beginning to make. And uh, please, in your panel, uh, when you leave your panel, uh, delegate someone to add some questions to the chat function uh, in this um, forum so that the, your questions get uh, put in the final 15 minute section of the um, uh, panel. So thank you. I think we're now over to panel sessions. Now, yes, so you've just been invited to join a panel. So Fred, you're going to field the questions and uh, and handle them now. Uh, is that right? Uh, as the questions get put in, um, and here's one from uh, I don't. It doesn't say who it's directed to, so I guess to anyone on the panel that can take this, which I suppose includes me. Oh dear, Angus <laughs> Jenkinson. What is the cybernetic rather than common sense aspect of say solving lobbying? 
Mm. Yeah, good question. Oh, well. Ed, why don't you uh, feel that one? Uh, sorry, the, what was the common sense? Could you just repeat the question? Well, it's, a dis it's distinguishing cybernetic from common sense, which it, uh, so that, you know, underlying any question, of course, there's some value systems, but the question is, what is the cybernetic rather than common sense aspect well, of it, solving lobbying? Of stopping lobbying. Solving oh. lobbying. Yeah, well, the, I mean, the, 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 in order to solve uh, lobbying, you you need uh, some process that forces attention onto the outcome of that lobbying. So at present, you can lobby, uh, let's say, for a particular piece of legislation which keeps in place an enormously complex tax collection system, which means that Intuit, in this case, can keep uh, selling its software. So. All, all of that happens and is happening now. Now, if you then say, okay, you're going to make a change, government, or you're not going to make a change. By the way, when you do that, there will be an independent uh, institution which will produce feedback that says, this is the results of what you've done. The results of what you've done are you've maintained an immensely costly system and you've cost uh, every citizen a lot of money in terms of running this system, and uh, you've maintained uh, your, your, your uh, software position uh, illicitly, corruptly. Um, so at that point, you can't hide, is the point, that uh, every time there's, there's a backdoor deal, then the backdoor deals are surfaced and put on the table. Now, if you then the cybernetic point is is you know like the thermostat something has to happen as a result of the feedback you can't just say yeah you, you screwed up and this is where the abandonment powers and abandonment program that would be driven by the independent institution which says look here is a law or a regulation you may have been very well intended or it may not have been well intended but let's say it was it's not working Therefore, it will stop. You have to abandon that and you have to think of another way. Um, now, uh, actually, in response to your question, what's the difference between that and common sense? Uh, well, in terms of my common sense, there is no difference whatsoever. So I agree with you. But uh, what you've got to remember is that people in power, um, uh, their common sense uh, is not necessarily the top of their motivation. Typically, politicians are driven most by uh, the desire, the need for personal power. So you've got to put some controls and checks and balances in. Okay, well, thanks, Ed. And uh, as with most of these, you know, getting back to <laughs> the idea of framing is that our idea here is to encourage conversation and dialogue rather than having answers to questions. And one thing that I, I would add to that is the frame within which most lobbying is done is a frame of persuasion, which is very different than a frame of creating dialogue and shared interests. And that actually connects with a question from Anya, uh, which I guess is directed more at you, Ray, uh, the, about the model biosphere, technosphere, social purpose, how do you see the relation to concepts of cultures of sustainability? Um, well, in the book, we, uh, we draw attention and, and talk openly about the um, systemic uh, sensibilities in many indigenous cultures, which have been um, uh, sublimated or lost and which uh, um, I talk about visiting the Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., and if you do a trip through that museum, what you encounter is uh, many uh, examples of a, what I would call a systemic sensibility, which was built into their institutions and cultural practices. So we've lost a lot of this out of our society, and we live in a, uh, uh, a world which I characterize primarily as systemic systematic cause and effect, a linear sort of world of linear prediction, linear uh, input, output, etc., rather than systemic relational dynamics. 
And so I think there are many cultures in which um, that um, systemic relational dynamic still exists. Uh, I think it's a characteristic of being human. And I think we in the Western intellectual tradition have uh, taken it out of our culture. We've become deculturated, if you like, around our own systemic sensibilities uh, by the institutions and education we, systems we've built. Uh, perhaps I'll leave it there in the benefit of other questions. May, may I uh, riff on that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. yeah um, for me, like when Fred and me were at, at Go Gabriola Island on a, working with all kinds of people, including indigenous people, then there's a sensitivity and an experience, a cybernetic experience in a way. When you sense what's happening there, you feel what it is, then you afterwards can talk about it and find language for that. So when you have a very rich experience, then a description is a lame description because you know it's a rich experience. And that's uh, what's often missing when you really sense what it is to be like in a groove or working in a way that's really making sense in a way that, that things work out that we would like to, to have, then we have a different conversation. Because once you've been in a conversation that is really working, then you can refer to that. And otherwise, when you would reframe something like a, a backdoor deal, then people might frame it as a front door parade or something. I agree with you. And uh, I mean, one of the arguments of the book uh, is, of course, in favor of uh, uh, privileging embodied cognition as a central way of, uh, of being in the world and uh, of uh, appreciating that we live in language uh, and uh, carry the consequences and responsibilities uh, of that. And that um, at the center of our contemporary world is a, I think, a, a mistaken notion of what it is to be homo, uh, to be human. And we have homo economicus at the center of our framing of the world as an economic system, uh, which is a very poverty stricken uh, notion of what it is to be human and uh, devoid of understanding humans as uh, relational uh, evolutionary um, mammals. Okay, and I might point out just so everyone has access to the chat that of course, this is one of the wonderful things about Zoom and it connects to ideas of governing and framing that there's a parallel conversation going on uh, in, in addition to the verbal conversation that we're having. So, uh, which is the real conversation right now. So we have a question from Mike that might require Mike to um, actually elaborate a little bit. Mike Andrews asks, what about the ideas of Ulrich and critical system heuristics and his 12 questions to incite reflection and dialogue? Do they apply here? Yeah, I'm happy to expand. So Werner Ulrich did some work on critical systems heuristics that uh, I've been introduced to, and it, it breaks down a set of questions, basically, in 12 ways that are about what are the sources of motivation, sources of control, um, sources of knowledge, and, and by teasing it apart, you're, you're, it's essentially considered an emancipatory process because you're bringing the people who are involved with the system into the room, uh, as opposed to being in a government room. What was the term that was used by Huda locked in a soundproof room uh, and allowing the people who are closest to the problems to work in conjunction with the so-called experts. And you're bringing in the experience of those people as opposed to doing something to them. That's just one application of those, the, the, essentially a, a simple rubric of 12 questions to tease apart a problem. Because any reasonable person on the street who looks at what's going on in Washington, for example, uh, knows that there's something radically wrong with that system where I may have an interest, I'm supposed to have a representative, but someone from industry is essentially lining his pocket to do his bidding. So I, I agree that there is systemic problems and just wondered if that approach of simplifying the process and involving the people and questioning the power that's there, is there an effective way to do that? Is that at the root of this kind of the democratic process that I've, I've kind of heard discussed? So Mike, you, would you like to? Speaking, no, just uh, pointing out that it, while you were speaking, Mike, that you had someone ask you to, to rattle off the 12 questions, but maybe you can put them 
in the chat while either Ray or Huda who's, uh, might respond. Go ahead, Ray, yeah. Huda, did you want to respond? Yes, uh, well, thank you for this question because I'm also, um, I appreciate very much CSH um, and the 12 questions of critical systems heuristics. And what it triggered first to me is uh, indeed there are sources of knowledge, uh, beneficiaries uh, and experts, expertise, and perhaps questioning who do we see as sources of expertise? Uh, and it's also, I think, perhaps cultural and social. The sources of expertise in a Western society might completely differ from who are seen as experts in different societies with different cultures. Um, and so I, I, I think that uh, the inclusion, and this is a, uh, thinking about how to bridge this gap between the deciders and those who have an experience, I like the term of Rick, experiences and something to bring to the conversation is might start with the vision, the world views of those who are in power who decide about where does this so-called expertise lie. And uh, I think in the examples of Sheldon, uh, the environment agency came to acknowledge the expertise that exists in the community in Sheldon. And this was part of the success to the response of this complex issue that they had. Um, I think CSH is, um, would be a helpful heuristic here to look at the system as it is, because it's also to see the is system, what it is, in terms if we see um, the systems, governance as a system and government as a system, and what is out to be. And so you would see that the victims in the first system would be the beneficiaries in the out to be system. And so these will necessarily trigger power dynamics, tensions, conflicts, so how to manage them. Uh, I would like also to take this uh, opportunity to quickly jump on the question regarding systemic sensibilities um, and in Western cultures and other cultures, and I am actually, my traditions come from both. I see a division, a divide when you, when you look at, we're always thinking in, in terms of cybernetics of creating this link, these connections that are missing. And perhaps there is in Western cultures, from my view, a disconnect in terms of cognitive, the recognition of cognitive approaches and cognitive institutions, even within our own body. We trust and we rely only on our head, what we think, what we read, what we listen to. Do we trust what our body feels? Other cultures do that pretty much. And it comes to a cognitive balance that might help this reconnection with the biosphere and this reconnection with us as humans and perhaps defining us as humans as being beyond just a thinking head might help. I don't know if I answered the questions properly, but that's well, Thank you. Um, Fred, can I just pick up a little bit yeah, no, there please, on that question at another level? I mean, one of the arguments of the book really is that um, uh, our governance systems are failing, uh, not necessarily through the uh, uh, practices of well-meaning individuals. Many of our governance systems have a lot of well-meaning individuals as well as a lot of narcissists and terrible people as well. But um, these are in Maturanan terms what we call structure determined systems. They're systems to structure what they can do and only do what they're capable of doing. And they, we are running into the limitations of the structural designs of our governance systems based on uh, our, our history, a whole set of historical uh, inventions, understandings, etc. And until we invent new institutions, new structures in which to act, and new practices to, for, to, to enact those institutions, then we're not going to change anything. And then thus CSH, as one of the many uh, lineages and traditions within the systems thinking and practice um, uh, uh, set of uh, possibilities, would be a, a key praxis uh, skill to develop in, a, in governance reform and government, governance enactment. But there are many others, of course, as well. But we are illiterate when it comes to doing these things and our institutions are poorly designed to enable them to be enacted. Thanks, Ray. So we also have a... Uh... We're nearing the end here, which is coming up very quickly. We have a question from Wendy, uh, which has some very interesting, for me, assumptions behind it. And her question is, did we lose the systemic sensibility 
because the rulers in most societies are the conquerors. And I think, you know, behind that is a, really something that cuts to the heart of your book and this conversation, which is, you know, is governing a role of someone who is in charge or is governing a participatory process? What, and um, I don't know if Wendy, if you want to elaborate on your question, if I got it right, or if uh, Ed, or- yeah, I mean, or? I guess I was thinking, you know, I was thinking, because I'm sitting, I'm, I'm an American sitting in Britain. And so, so I'm sort of, you know, aware of, you know, Britain being um, conquered by one group and uh, the States, you know, sort of the European, the, the European structures. Um, and I think that's really what I was thinking of. But also that, it started with the thought that, yes, this is all very nice, but how are you going to get people to accept it when the people who are in power are people who got there because the system worked for them? Yeah. And, you know, Britain has been talking about getting rid of first past the post for, I don't know, 30, 40 years at least. And, you know, it's never going to happen because once the, once the party is in power, they have no motivation to change it. And so a party like the Liberal Democrats, which of course are, are cratered now for various reasons, um, never really got close, mm. even, even at their peak. Mm. And, you know, I look around, to Americans, proportional representation means the distribution of Congress, Congress people across the population of states. In Europe, proportional representation means uh, representing the, the views of the populace as, as proportionally in in legislatures and so i think also that's one problem in talking about this is that it doesn't mean the same thing in those two countries anyway i mean and just to bang in very quickly that um systems thinking i've concluded is the alternative to uh politics and that's why politicians don't like it because it's the competition and uh the way in which people your point there that get into politics that there's a certain type and style people who are very good at arguing people who are very good at uh, you know quickly processing stuff people and, and people who, and people who panic at the thought that it might take a little longer to count the ballots exactly and and, and of course uh, typically in this country the politics and media is reduced to a sporting spectacle so we keep it as an adversarial thing and, and we'll punch each other and the one who wins the argument, you know, that's what we're gonna do. It's madness. Systems thinking is the alternative, just like I think compassion from the Froome project is the alternative to capitalism. And so it, it's very hard, but we need to recognize that, that we're in a competition here. Is one allowed to query a, a comment like that? Please do. So I would, for example, query that politicians aren't interested in systems thinking. I think many of them are deeply interested in systems thinking. I would make a differentiation between systems thinking and cybernetic thinking. But for the moment, I think they're deeply interested in things that can bring about the systems order that they want to have. Is it perhaps the case that the question isn't whether they're interested in systems thinking, but what ethical outcomes are they interested in when they deploy their systems thinking? It, it, I mean, it may, may well be both, um, but uh, the, 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 I mean, back to Ray's point about the structural determinants, you know, the, the, the structural determinants of the systems that politicians enter are very much about individuals making their way up a slippery pole and eventually they get to the top where they perceive the most power is fairly obviously and and that is their motivation to get there it it, it may well be that um as, as ray has said and i've said often you know they can often be well intentioned but they're but they're we, you know politics is just everywhere you know, it's time. Why, why would on earth would you have politics involved in producing a really good school system or a really good health system? I mean, the politics is: Do we want one? Well, if we want one, that's fine. Now, the how? What? What has that got to do with political parties? For goodness' sake! Um, so, yes, it, it 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 may be the ethics as well, but um, yeah. yeah so can I just pick up on one? 
Yeah, go ahead, Ray. Yeah, you got the same message I did that we need to wrap up, unfortunately. Yeah, well, that's just very quickly. I mean, underpinning all this, of course, is our own individual theories of change. Um, and how do we imagine that change might happen? One of the arguments of the book is that uh, the only real locus of change is going to come from civil society, i.e. from us. Mm. And the state won't change itself. Mm. And um, if it's civil society, then societies like ours that we're here meeting today are part of that civil society. And until we can build a conversation, a set of discourses, and do what, our, um, what the American people did in developing their first constitution, or the Australian people or the New Zealand people did in building new countries and new constitutions to govern themselves, only then will we reinvent our governance systems. So Ray, as the convener of this session, I'm wondering if you'd like to end with a few questions for people as we go over time. So since cybernetics is also very much an understanding of boundaries, I, I suppose you do have this temporal okay, boundary well, uh, that we're my, about to uh, exceed. So. My understanding is that the next session is now starting on another channel or another platform. Uh, so those who need to go to the next session uh, are invited to do so. And my understanding is that this, uh, this platform will remain open for 15 minutes and uh, Huda, Fred, Ed and I will be here for the next 15 minutes and we're very happy to have whatever conversation emerges uh, from uh, over that time. Thank you everyone. Yeah. And, and thanks everyone whose questions, obviously we are only able to pick up a few questions from the chat. Uh, and we tried to be, uh, I don't know, fair is the right word, just pick out questions that um, allowed for conversation. Roy, who's your publisher? Uh, Routledge. Okay. Um, is and, there a uh, particular contact there for review copies? Um, yes, if you um, email me, I can send it to you. Okay, what's your email address? Ray.ison at open.ac.uk. Wait a minute. Ray, Ray at? Ray.ison at open. Oh. Yeah. Dot ac dot uk. Oh, Open University. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, can, can I encourage someone to ask a question of Fred? Fred's been very ki kindly fielding the questions, and so... Um, uh, I mean, Fred's point about, I mean, we spend quite a bit of time in, uh, in several chapters about the whole issue of framing and what, uh, what I call um, deframing, reframing, and, and, or framing and then reframing, uh, to get out of our current trap. A lot of what we've got to do is deframe what we ca is currently constraining us. Well, I think there was a question perhaps for Fred coming from our group. And this question was about what do we mean by social purpose? And I think it comes positively in the, in the idea of framing a social purpose and how, what this can be. Well, I think the, I mean, the, the example, I mean, some of the people whose examples I was giving were actually on in the meeting right now, so they could have answered them. But it was more recognizing that, you know, there, the idea of framing can be applied to framing itself, right? And there's this idea that m most media actually develop that you can frame an argument and the notion that it can be legislated. And it, you know, from the point of view of governing, it suggests that these self-corrections that you recognize that you need to make are based upon your framing of a situation which may be very different. And who do your examples, as well as some of the questions point to that. And Bateson's idea was much more, and it was picked up by Goffman, much more of an interactive view of framing that uh, framing is something, and this is where the notion of frame dilemmas comes in, that it's, it's gotta be an interactive process and you're always asking yourself, are we even in the same conversation? I mean, that, you know, the, the funny thing is, of course, that could also be applied to this session, like were people being present to you, Huda, while you were speaking, or are they uh, saying something about, hey, you should read what I wrote about this in the chat? And uh, are these, uh, moving in parallel together. So the, the ways in which we communicate with each other becomes an important part of governance. Mm -hmm. um, and are there, are there mechanisms, that's what Mike Andrews' question points is, are there mechanisms, procedures, and we're really designing in the act of governing as a participatory process 
Do we also need to have ways of uh, designing processes for uh, design, for example? So it's um, an open question and one that requires a bit of humility on our part. Okay. So what I'm seeing is, what I'm hearing actually is, is framing as an emergence of a conversation and when we think, and I, if I think about social framing and link it to the approaches that were used EDD or DAD, there can be a social purpose coming from a DAD process that right. is decided, announced and defended or a social purpose that is um, emerging from an engagement, a deliberation and then agreed upon and it's an unfolding purpose. Actually, it took me time to differentiate between goal and purpose and understanding why in systems thinking we would rather go to purpose rather than goal. In project management, the goal is there always. And it's like this point in time and we have a direct line and we go to it. And we don't see the pitfalls in the middle. Whereas this purpose is framed, deframed, reframed as, we, as the path unfolds and where there is this interplay with our traditions of understandings, of course. This is where the emergence and the dialogue and conversation comes comes at play. How do we negotiate all this? Right. Mm. I'd, I'd just like to come in because I think oops, we've just uh, experienced in the UK a case of radical reframing, deframing with the um, latest uh, bizarre flips of the um, the government suddenly going, oh, Yes, we did make this agreement, but we've decided we're not going to do that and we're going to do something completely different. And then their explanation goes on. This is all because the EU's got an extreme interpretation of what we were saying. I mean, you know, I think this is something that continually happens in political processes and people use the power they can, they can mobilise to reframe an argument and then having reframed it, they hope they can then win it and go wherever they happen to want to go at that particular moment in time. So I, I, again, I, think, yeah, I, I think already there is a level of recursion so that the political actors will actually set out to reframe. And as regards the, the, the uh, um, governance framework, they may choose to ignore it if they feel they can get away with it. I was just going to, uh, I mean, I take your point about what's going on. It's appalling, uh, the recent turn, but, um, but again, it's, uh, the, the system is structured so that they can do it. And, uh, and the question will be whether the legal system, that, that other part of the governance system has enough um, uh, control uh, in a sense to operate and, uh, and do it. And of course, a lot, depends on what the response is by the Europeans. But in our book, we talk about, we make a comparison, which has been made by other people, but it's worth thinking about in a cybernetic uh, audience. And that is between the conduct of the Irish referendum about abortion and the referendum about Brexit in the UK. The referendum in Ireland was designed in such a way as to be deliberative and to allow uh, a uh, selection of a hundred citizens to participate in a long process over a year and to receive evidence and input from citizens and all interest groups about the abortion issue, abortion issue. And the state through the agency of the president said, we will accept the outcomes and recommendations of this panel and we will build that into the referendum. And that referendum passed with 68% support. It had people understood the issues. They knew where they sat. They understood that people were opposed from moral. All of those issues were understood. And I would say that purpose was unfolding in that deliberative process. Whereas the British one was set up as a dualism. It was an either or self-negating pair. Win, lose, win, lose. It had nothing in it that was capable of uh, dealing with difference or with allowing people to move through learning and deliberation such that their understandings and practices were capable of changing. Uh, I, I'd like to say something about uh, framing and reframing in very complex systems like uh, I, I 
he played in Brazil with uh, state government, including mun municipalities and also state government, the society in general, and also the federal government, and also UNESCO. So several layers of power uh, relationships everywhere to each direction. That all the purpose was, uh, was biased depending on the stakeholder. And uh, coming from a transdisciplinary approach, I understand sometimes we need to have a method, a methodology like the World Cafe, where we can bring several people together, representing the best possible all the stakes, stakeholders involved, and uh, unframe ourselves, you know, co-evolve to reframe something from letting go what we come from, you know, the values and the principles that are our interests so that we can really, as we, I, I, I used to say, unframe the context so that we can view ourselves as not in a power relationship, but mainly in a community relationship where these things that we create, uh, you know, the, the abstraction like government, economy, uh, public health, every, everything that, that we name become as just one context of observation where so we can find a way to have consensus of what principles are we going to carry on our discussions forward so we can reframe together. And this is not an instant moment because other people come, other situations come, all other lo locals come. So as in my experience, after four years, we could include more than 300,000 students discussing what would be best for their community. So including parents in government, local, municipal, and um, state and also the federal government. And uh, so my understanding and my, from my more than, more than theory, but really practice is that we need to, as you mentioned, be humble to accept that maybe instead of convincing someone, you try to be convinced someone for, by someone else's idea that could be best than yours, better than yours. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, if no one else, uh, I, I mean, uh, here in Australia, uh, Sean may know, know about this. Uh, when the uh, pandemic hit, uh, we had a formation of a uh, institution called the National Cabinet. The, federal government and the state premiers collaborated with each other and with experts in the face of un tremendous uncertainty, not knowing what they're doing, and they were open to the unfolding circumstances and worked collaboratively together to do a lot of things that the Australian people really valued. That worked for a period of time and is a classic example of what I think the systemic family therapists talk about as a problem determined system. They had a problem and they begin to build a system around it. Now, that has broken down and it's turning back to politics as usual, where the federals are uh, pursuing their political interests, the states are doing uh, their thing as well. The Australian electorate seem to me be pretty uh, annoyed about all of this. And it's turned back into what in, uh, again, the family therapist would call about a system determined problem. So it's about each uh, constituency trying to conserve its system of interest uh, in the light of the circumstances. And so I, I guess to take up that Brazilian example, uh, what I heard from what you said then, uh, Flavio, was essentially the co-construction of problem determined systems in which you're your uh, own senses of uh, understandings and practices uh, shift and move uh, in collaboration with others. Okay, well, we're, we've only got a minute or so to go, so I perhaps we could just um, uh, wrap up there. I'd like to thank my fellow panelists for participating and thank you for participating as well in the, this conversation. And uh, I think all uh, four of us would be 
very happy to have follow-up emails or conversations if anyone wants to uh, to do it. Um, yeah, we need the. If you haven't been aware of the book, please have a look. No, I was just saying that uh, we need the meeting needs a coffee house where we can join, right? So uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. For it. Yeah. I've got a bottle of wine open, and it's time. Well, it's for a me different to get time of day for you. So. Okay.